On this very special upcoming New Year's Eve, thousands of Americans will be spending the night at the last place they might have expected. The cemetery. It was the year 2000. The last remnants of humanity survived in underground shelters in the aftermath of Y2K. Though the food in the shelters was bad and the music often worse, some comfort was found in the fact that the Sony PlayStation and some scattered CRTs here and there were not lost in the fallout. Before the fallout, people of America enjoyed a time of JRPG prosperity, with fantastic titles such as Final Fantasy VII, Super Mario RPG, Chrono Trigger, and Final Fantasy Tactics paving the way. Sony had seen great success localizing Final Fantasy VII to the West, but following that, the series would no longer be in their hands. Not one to miss out on the action, Sony was already a step or two ahead, with one of their teams at Japan Studio working on an original IP in the genre. This IP was called The Legend of Dragoon, a four-disc turn-based JRPG with unprecedented real-time battle mechanics that merged tactical ability with player skill, all carried along by an incredible OST and cutting-edge visuals for the time. And it was through this game that in the confines of my fallout shelter, I hid from the realities of the world. A young boy in his early teens, where I got absorbed in the adventures of Dart and his companions, journeying from one corner of endiness to the other, leaving my real life troubles at the door and igniting a passion for the JRPG genre that would follow me for the rest of my life. What I present to you today is not just a retrospective on The Legend of Dragoon, but my retrospective on The Legend of Dragoon. What it means to me, and what it means for a game to be one of my favorite games of all time. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tark's Gauntlets. I'm Tark's, these are my gauntlets. I've been living a lie on YouTube for many years. I've always just been Tark's without the gauntlets, and it's time that ended. Now, before we get too far into this, if you guys like what you see here, please leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe, you know, that stuff does help out. And similar to the Vita video that came before this, I do have a couple people that I featured here as guests, albeit in a smaller capacity than before. So you might hear a couple voices throughout the video that you're familiar with or not familiar with. And if you're not familiar with them, please, by all means, open the description box below and follow the links to their channels. Show them some love, they're great guys, and I owe them a huge thanks for making this video what it is. But with that, this is my long overdue talk about The Legend of Dragoon, a game I've long held as one of my favorites on this platform that I've never actually done due justice for or proper coverage. Here's hoping I can do it today. I got my critics cap on as much as I possibly can, but just know going in, I am a really big fan of this game, and regardless of what criticisms I levy at it, this game will always hold a very special place in my heart. So, let's get into it. <laughs> Part 1, Development. It was 1996 when Japan Studio first started development on The Legend of Dragoon, with a then relatively unknown Shuhei Yoshida serving as the game's executive producer. Shuhei at this time was a young up-and-comer within Sony. Having graduated from UCLA in 1993, he would spend the next couple years working at Sony handling third-party licensing agreements prior to the launch of the PlayStation 1. It was through this line of work he found himself involved in the production of other PlayStation classics such as Gran Turismo and the slew of games Japan Studio was working on simultaneous to The Legend of Dragoon, games like Eco or Ape Escape. Chosen as the game's director was another up-and-comer, Yasuyuki Hasabi. The Legend of Dragoon would be Yasuyuki's most challenging project to date, and the first game he would have such authority on, with his previous experiences in the field being generally smaller in scope, such as his credit in Super Mario RPG The Legend of the Seven Stars as battle designer, or his involvement with Final Fantasy VI, where he served in a similar capacity. They were important jobs for sure, but ones that being the director of The Legend of Dragoon would eclipse entirely, even if some of the other games would have a larger legacy. As part of his role as a director, Yasuyuki would outline the story, however the script was passed off to Takahiro Kamenagiyoshi to fill out. Art direction was split up between a number of talented artists, with each one focusing on a specific aspect of the game that played to their strengths. Kenichi Iwata was the main art director and personally saw to the designs of the Dragoon armor, special outfits certain characters would transform into during battle sequences. With the 
aid of Tatsuya Nakamura, he also had a hand in creating the general character designs. Though character names didn't mean much to the characters they were given to, their designs became very intentional, reflecting their personalities and elemental powers. Rose, rather famously, was first designed with vibrant green hair. Being switched to the characteristic raven black we know her for now, as her character developed over the course of writing. With Dragon serving such a large role in this title, it was of utmost importance they get the designs right and establish the creatures as larger-than-life, menacing, incredible beasts. For this task, they employed the expertise of Hirohiko Ioku, who would later go on to work on the Soul Sacrifice series, God Eater, and the incredible Lost Odyssey from Mistwalker Studios. The majority of other enemy and creature designs was handled by Itsuo Ito, who was also working on the SNK title Blazing Star around the same time. Development on The Legend of Dragoon would last an extensive three years, something common if not short in today's landscape but at the time was almost unheard of. Though the team started off small, they would add more people as development progressed and would get more and more complicated. Adding special lighting effects to stages as well as particle and smoke effects became a major hang-up during development, as the studio had little to no experience with this sort of thing in the past and found out the hard way was not as easy as they anticipated, though it did come out looking great in the end, as you can see in one of the game's very first screens. Before the end of production, they had over 100 staff working on the game, and the budget had ballooned to an astronomical $16 million, not the least of which was being spent on state-of-the-art pre-rendered 3D environments and matte paintings, as well as CGI cutscenes courtesy of Sony's Polyphony Digital Studio. These CG cutscenes were not initially going to be included in the game, as the director felt it would be too jarring to switch between the in-game models and the cutscene models, but what eventually tipped the scales on that was simply how cool they thought these high-fidelity models would look, flying around in some intense action scenes sequences, and granted, they did look really cool. And though some people may find it jarring, pre-rendered cutscenes like this are something I always took with a sense of reward upon reaching or unlocking. After three years, hundreds of hands on the project, and $16 million sunk into it, the day finally came around for the public to get their time with it, and when it finally released... Hey, Joe, he cut my head off. Did you see that? He cut my head off. It was met with mostly mixed reception. What a wuss. While it certainly garnered fans, old and young like myself, who would herald it as one of the best, most unique, and most influential games of its time, it had just as many people who felt it was lacking in some capacity, that its unique combat ideas were a black mark on the game, and its somewhat stock story was too forgettable. The worst of the criticisms, however, seemed to be rooted in something we see a lot today from modern games journalists, wherein you can find them comparing every new RPG to the likes of Persona 5. Of course, Persona 5 wasn't out in the year 2000, so it came off more like this. No Final Fantasy 7. What if I smoke? Didn't ask him. Ongoing and frankly misplaced comparisons to Final Fantasy VII really seemed to drag down reviews at the time, and not just for The Legend of Dragoon, but for many RPGs of the era. But this was also a time when we were somewhat spoiled with the genre. Some things we might deem exceptional today may not have got their due credit back when they released, as there was just so much going on that it was easy, if not normal, to take it for granted. And that's not to say LOD would have reviewed any better or worse without the Golden Child to hold it up against, but I do feel the conversation around the game would have at least been more productive and illustrative absent these comparisons. As it is, however, that is the reputation it gained at launch, and the reputation many still carry around. Despite having almost nothing in common save for some menu design ideas, it's often regarded as the game that tried too hard to be Final Fantasy VII. So let's look at this Final Fantasy VII clone now and see if it really puts the mid in Midgar, or if it's a legend worthy of its namesake. Our story begins with a bang. Quite literally, a bang. We find the quiet town of Celis under attack. Soldiers close in on civilians. Buildings are bombed into rubble. Amidst all this, one girl is pulled from the wreckage, spared from death or injury. This girl is Shauna, 
the mayor's adopted daughter. After running a check on the girl and confirming her identity, the Sandoran army takes her captive, transporting her to Helena prison, where she is to remain until she can fulfill her role in a larger, more mysterious plot. On the outskirts of the town a short while later, Dart, our main character, is returning to Celis after a five-year journey to track down the Black Monster, a mysterious creature that murdered his family 18 years prior. As he follows the road through the woods, he's attacked by the first of this title's dragons, Fairbrand. This guy, right here. Dart stands no chance against the beast as he is now, but as luck would have it, a traveling warrior named Rose saves him from his would-be fate, then leaves him to continue his journey back to Celis, the place he called home after his own town was destroyed in the same attack that killed his parents. Upon arriving in Celis, Dart finds it in ruin, with only a few Sandoran soldiers left behind. After dispatching them, he hears of how his childhood friend and sweetheart Shauna was taken, and the epic quest to save her and discover her importance begins taking Dart and his growing party of companions from one end of Endiness to the other. And yes, the world in Legend of Dragoon is called Endiness, or at least this part of it is. They do frequently make reference to Earth as a location, so I guess it takes place on our own planet, but in a fictional high fantasy continent called Endiness. Alright, so we got, the, we got the world map here, I, I got, there's, there's an end here, and I got, I got another end here, there's some ends down here. And uh, over here we, we got some some more ends, and uh, the, the whole thing is shaped like a boot. Shaped like a boot? No one would believe a map like that exists. You got a name for this? Well, well we got these ends here, and this is another end here. Hey, shaped like a it's called Endiness. And I'm not gonna knock on Endiness too much. This universe is absolutely gorgeous. There are so many towns plucked straight out of the high fantasy sphere with crazy good original designs we hardly ever see the likes of today. The adventure from here on out is just a generally well-executed take on a lot of traditional high fantasy stories and parables. And to some people, this might rub them the wrong way, but I do feel there is always room in any genre for traditional stories, though it does seem nowadays you can only get away with it if your name is Dragon Quest. But it's not like they were lazy about recreating tradition here either. The Legend of Dragoon feeds you one event after another, constantly pushing the plot forward, establishing drama, and shaping the world. The world itself is also pretty well fleshed out, with political subplots fueling wars between lands or strife between races, and a historical war that dates back 11,000 years whose effects still have yet to be undone. This war was known as the Dragon Campaign. It was here an ancient race known as the Winglies engaged in combat against the humans for domination of Endiness. The Winglies created monsters known as Virages to battle the humans, the dragons, and their band of dragoons. Dragoons who would be hailed as war heroes despite their tragic ending. The humans of course won this war, bringing about the extinction of the Winglies and their Virages and scattering the spirits of the fallen dragoons. At least until one day when they would fall into the hands of those whose souls, as called by fate, would resonate with them, and the power of the Dragoon would be taken up again to save humanity from the next looming disaster or aid in its ultimate downfall. There's no massive theme that runs through the core of the game save for the loose take on our characters fighting against fate, but each character has their own theme and story to get invested in. One of my favorites was Hashel, who doesn't seem to be much of a fan favorite, but perhaps I just felt some personal relation to him and his story. When you encounter him, Hashel is decades into a quest to find his daughter Claire, a girl who had run away from home after Hashel had pushed her too hard to be a fighter and take up her family's legacy. He's a father who struggled to maintain a good balance between his paternal responsibilities and a self-imposed responsibility to carry on his family's legacy through his offspring regardless of their wishes. Now I don't so much relate to every detail in this story, but I do know what it's like to be estranged from a father. At least I did at the time I first played this. So this part of the game, this story, and this character really resonated with me and helped me navigate some complicated feelings at a young age. It probably helps too that Hashel kind of bears a resemblance to my own goofy real life dad and uh, dad if you're watching, if you end up seeing this, I swear that's a good thing, really. 
With Hashel, I gotta say, I also really liked his relationship with Meru, the energetic and perky young hammer dancer. Hashel, though serious when necessary, also allows himself to just let loose and enjoy some good old fashioned hijinks. But where so much of the cast is trying their best to be responsible as young adults bearing the weight of the world, Meru, the youngest of the main characters, is Hashel's only real outlet to indulge this side of his personality with. And they form an excellent duo. And of course, we would be remiss not to mention Darts, our main character's two big relationships. First, we have his relationship with Shauna, whom he starts off being very protective of and treating something like a little sister despite her objections and her desire to prove herself to Dart as a grown-up capable of taking care of herself. Though she often ends up in the position of a damsel in distress, she goes to great lengths to prove to Dart that that is simply not who she is and that she can be independent and strong just like him. At one point, we see this trope refreshingly turned on its head through Dart's other main relationship in the game, his relationship with the charming mama's boy knight, Lavitz. These two easily have one of the strongest relationships in the game and funnest, most wholesome bromances JRPGs have to offer. But while Dart is busy looking out for Shauna, telling her to watch her step here, to let him lift the heavy thing there, and to kill the enemies everywhere, it ends up being Lavitz who finds himself on unstable ground in need of saving. It's something of a quick awakening for Dart that Shauna may be more capable of taking care of herself than he believed, and that perhaps it's his other companions that could use the extra attention every now and again. Perhaps just due to the age it came out, The Legend of Dragoon also does something I really appreciate with its characters. It commits. Relationships aren't teased and then left vague so players could have their fantasies about whom they ship, and they're not tied to some social mechanic that might result in important bits of backstory or character development falling by the wayside. LOD is, narratively and adventure-wise, a linear game, and for as scared of that word as people have become, I'd argue it's definitely a good thing. Our two leading characters, Dart and Shauna, become a couple only halfway through the game, allowing the player to enjoy how they grapple with their emotions before actually giving us the payoff of seeing them together, which is then followed by more drama as they battle together the forces that threaten the world. Too many other games seem to chicken out on the romance aspect, at best maybe showing characters kiss or hold hands while the credits roll, but often, at worst, just leaving the relationship open in case the players wanted the MC to end up with somebody else. And if you'll allow me a second to rant here, let me just say, that it's weak. Show me my characters falling in love, all right? I like the romance. Show me my characters struggling to learn about being in a relationship and developing not just as individuals, but as a unit for the strength of their bond. Hell, show me my characters breaking up if that's the path it has to go down. Whatever the case, stop building relationships up just to do nothing with them in the end. The Legend of Dragoon gets this part of its characters and story right, and I love it for that now more than ever. Pushing that aside for a second, however, it doesn't get everything right. Maybe it's just that this YouTube thing I do has caused me to be more observant and critical than I was the last time I played, but I can safely say there are issues with the writing here and there. It has this recurring issue where anytime a character is rendered inaccessible or out of commission for story reasons, they get replaced by somebody else who inexplicably has about the same movesets or at least the same elements and weapon type, which can feel a little cheap. The bulk of writing issues, however, mostly comes from a somewhat stilted localization that sometimes fails to get the character's personalities across as well as it should, and at times it may even contain typos and syntax errors. But the biggest issue is probably just the game's recurring poor approach to exposition, often establishing big parts of a character's backstory right before boss battle to give it some extra weight, weight that should have been established more organically in other places where it maybe wouldn't come across as being forced in for drama's sake. And it's not that the character backstories in these sections are bad or the exposition establishes things that are bad for the story, it's all great really, it's just how it's brought up that's often the problem. Now, this wasn't an uncommon issue back in the day, and even now, a lot of devs still struggle to get this part of writing correct, but it is something that I think many critical-minded people might pick up on as having not aged the best. But for me, this may be the one part of the game that really shows its age. So, like, yeah, the, the story's a little bit tropey, okay? Uh, and maybe some people might even say generic. It's really just a bunch of common high fantasy tropes. Like, you got your phantom ship, the Colosseum, you know, your your dead companion partway through the game, your love interests, uh, your maze desert, all the stuff that makes up classic fantasy games and fantasy anime 
is present in The Legend of Dragoon. And some people will complain, yeah, so it's too tropey, but here's the deal. You gotta get over the word trope, okay? Everything is a fucking trope. And what really matters is whether a game is utilizing the tropes you like in ways that you like. And The Legend of Dragoon, like, yeah, these are my tropes, classic anime tropes. I love this stuff. So just like a PSA for all future criticism you might come across in your life, if you hear somebody use the word trope or tropey, don't always take it as inherently negative. Those tropes might be exactly what you're looking for. And for me, the tropes here are exactly what I'm looking for. Now let's talk about the combat. Feeling like it's hardly aged a day to me, the combat is still incredible. Instanced and random in nature and set in some of the game's only proper 3D environments, it isn't a very deep system, but it's not overwrought with convoluted mechanics either. If anything, it's quite straightforward and light on mechanics. However, a couple well thought out unique ideas sets The Legend of Dragoon apart from most RPGs still today. Given this is an RPG, you have your general set of affairs, your guard, run, attack, items, HP, HP and MP meters, as well as something called SP. With exception to the items and run commands, none of these work exactly how you might expect. Let's look at the guard mechanic first. Sure, using it will decrease the amount of damage a player might take on the next turn, but it also has the added benefit of replenishing a small amount of HP, allowing you to save your consumable items, which have a hard limit of 32. And that's not 32 each, it's 32 items total. A hard restriction to work under at times, but one that very strongly benefits the game's balance and further validates the slow healing process of the guard mechanic. The weapons and armor are not included as part of your 32 item limit, it's not filled up with just healing and revives. The items menu can also hold very powerful attack items that disappear upon use and require no cost save for that of a turn to use them on. Some of these attack items are just epic looking cutscenes of sorts that deal damage absent of player input, where others can be powered up over the course of the animation by mashing the X button. If you if you don't have a very strong mashing ability, you may not find these items to be too useful. But if you can mash well enough to save Meryl in Metal Gear Solid's torture sequence every time, then yeah, these items are gonna make a huge difference for you. A lot of people have their own technique for button mashing too. So of course, here's mine. All right, now this is very professional stuff. First, you gotta brace the controller on something, hold the analog stick out of the way, and then with your index fingers, fingernail, just molest the f***ing sh** out of it. 240%. Magic attacks and characters all have elemental weaknesses and strengths, which you can take advantage of by acknowledging the enemy's element as indicated by the color that appears in the dialogue window behind their name. Just one of many neat ways the game uses its UI non-invasively to translate information to the player. One of my favorite areas you see this too is in the icons that appear above yours and the enemy's heads, showing what of three ranges their health pool is currently sitting at. A similar icon using the same color scheme can be seen above your head while exploring dungeons and the world map, turning from blue to yellow to red as you get closer to entering a random encounter. But the UI isn't all sunshine and roses. The weapon equip screens or item buying and selling screens are painfully dated and slow to use, especially the item shops. There's no way to stack purchases or sales. It's one at a time, and after every sale, you get bumped back a menu and need to navigate through the items list again immediately after. You get used to it, but it's a harsh sign of the times. Getting back to combat, however, by far the most unique aspect is actually your standard attack. When you select attack, you perform something called an addition, which isn't all too unlike a rhythm game, hitting X as the two blue squares over overlap or circle if the squares turn orange, which indicates an incoming counterattack. If you miss hitting circle on a counterattack, your addition ends and the player takes damage. If you miss without a counterattack incoming, your addition simply ends. The additions start off rather simple, only requiring the player to hit one rather slow moving predictable prompt. But as the game progresses, they get more and more sophisticated, reaching seven to nine prompts for the hardest ones with increasing rhythmic complexity. As you progress through the game and start fighting harder enemies, the chances of counterattacks goes up. And with some of these additions being so fast paced, the window to respond to the sudden change a counterattack introduces can be very hard to operate within, and the timing windows for normal attacks are already unforgiving as it is. However, if you do nail your additions, every 20 times an addition is successfully completed, the addition
condition will level up, increasing the total damage percent modifier as well as the amount of SP gained per hit. And we'll talk more about SP in a moment. Thanks to the additions being able to level up, it is viable to bring the earliest edition straight to the end of the game and still pose a credible threat against the enemies and the final boss. Though the final secret editions, the ones that require you to max level every edition a character has to unlock them, have a much higher stat ceiling and should absolutely be pursued to the best of anybody's ability. However, there is a slight snag in pursuing them. The Legend of Dragoon, I feel, is an extremely well-balanced game, never requiring the player to grind, but maintaining a fair challenge all the way through. But that's really only true in the international release. As was the case with many JRPGs at the time, when The Legend of Dragoon left Japan, enemy stats were lowered across the board, which made it so players no longer had to grind. But this also meant that battles in general were now shorter and less frequent. With less battles and less turns, of course there's less opportunities to successfully perform an addition, which means you are likely to progress the plot a lot faster than you progress your addition levels. Due to this, the chances of unlocking the secret additions by the end or leveling them up are quite a bit lower than they were in the Japanese version. This rings double true for any character you don't regularly use. XP share to non-active party members is pretty low in the game, and there's no way to level additions for anybody not in use. And in a way, I find this somewhat discouraging when it comes to trying out new party members. Because mixing up the party a lot throughout a playthrough means either increasing grinding time tenfold or lessening the likelihood of unlocking your most powerful attacks, I personally feel compelled to choose my three member party and leave them locked for the entirety of the run. On this playthrough, I decided to use Hashel and Meiru mainly, as well as Dart, who is party locked anyway. Though I only put these two on my party after the Dragoon Spirits had been acquired, which still cost me some addition levels in the end. It's because of all this I feel the average playthrough for people involves Rose and Albert. Very strong and capable fighters for sure, but very much what I would consider a vanilla playthrough. A great composition for a first time run, but for repeat playthroughs, I would highly recommend exploring some of the other cast members. That all aside though, I love additions. They are hands down my favorite attack mechanic from any JRPG. They're also the reason I never use the archer character in this game, as they don't actually have additions and just strike me as incredibly boring to play with. Though there are some battles where they absolutely slay the enemies thanks to their dragoon spirits. Additions are also the reason why I was never beat up in school. You do not want to mess with a kid who knows all of Legend of Dragoon's additions in real life. Hey, back off, man, for it. Five ring shattering you into next week. That was my double slash. You don't want to see me at Madness Hero. All right? Harpoon! Just to win dance! But getting back to that note on Dragoon Spirits and on SP. SP is spirit power, and it's the stat that must be charged for characters to transform into Dragoons during battle. Well, in Dragoon State, you only have two options, attack, and magic. Magic is where you spend the earlier mentioned MP. As there are no mage class characters in the game, every character has spells and massive magical attacks they can cast when transformed. The higher a character's Dragoon level, the more spells they'll have at their disposal. MP is a valuable resource, so its limited accessibility will encourage some amount of reservation in using these attacks. And hopefully the reservation will also make the heart grow more fond of the attack animations, because these suckers are long. And not only are they long, they're unskippable. And you know what? Any other time I might have a personal complaint about that, but I love watching these so much I wouldn't skip them if I could. Same with the Dragoon transformations. Now, there is a setting in the options to change to short animations for those not like myself, but there's no option to skip them at the press of a button. So this is a setting you might have to change every time there's a new animation that you might want to check out. The Dragoon standard attack is a mini game kind of like additions, but very stripped back. You simply time button presses as an icon moves past a marker while spinning around around in a circle with increasing velocity. These require some precise timing, but if you can nail one of the more complicated additions, you can hit perfect on these eventually as well. Now, if all three party members have max SP, you can trigger all three to enter Dragoon mode with a special icon that appears in this event. Transforming all three works the same as transforming individually. Spells cost the same, you get the same defense buffs, etc. The only real benefit is that a character who triggered special mode bypasses the attack minigame and gets auto perfect on it. Perfect gives you quite the mass 
massive damage boost. While this seems like an auto win button and in small battles it really would be, there is a downside to it that needs to be considered before engaging. Since Dragoons can only attack and use magic, you need to be prepared to go up to 5 turns without the ability to guard or use items. This means that if you need to heal, it will come down to any Dragoon who has a healing spell, though it's not exactly likely you'll have one of those on your team. Because of this, it becomes a neat part of strategizing in the harder battles who will enter Dragoon mode and when, or whether that major risk of entering special mode is actually worth it. All in, I absolutely love this battle system. But as so much time has passed since its release, and I've aged enough to look at things more critically, it's a bit more clear where its flaws really lie. The degree to which using new characters sets you back or impedes your progress, ultimately making your main battle party weaker without excessive grinding is kind of a big issue. And it's not just level grinding, it'd be addition grinding too, which there's no way to speed up. It's not like level grinding where you can just stick around in the most XP rich environment. Additions are a fixed stat from beginning to end. The difficulty of the battle or the addition itself doesn't make a difference. The thing is, I'm not sure what the solution for this sort of thing could actually be. A DBZ style hyperbolic time chamber you can throw characters into and just batch fight enemies with increased addition leveling effects would work, but it really wouldn't fit in with the world and might cheapen the experience of leveling them up properly. Maybe as a new game plus feature, something like that could be cool, but Legend of Dragoon has no new game plus. So while it's a clearly flawed battle system, I have to say unable to come up with a better solution, I just have to accept for now that flaws are a part of it and possibly a necessity for building what's ultimately my favorite battle system ever. And I think this just goes to show that things don't actually have to be perfect. I feel a better measure of quality or enjoyment can be found by observing what's left over when the flaws are accounted for. And and how what's left over resonates with you as an individual. And for me, this sh just slaps. Dungeons in The Legend of Dragoon, while not genre peak or anything, I think are also great. Much like the towns, the dungeons all have their own unique flair, some even with their own unique sets of mechanics. For instance, the very first dungeon you encounter is one of those good old-fashioned maze-like situations, where off-screen paths make exits terminate in unexpected areas. It's not a big dungeon, and most of the dungeons aren't, usually only being 5 to 15 screens. But at least it's not the series of connected hallways easily navigated with a minimap we so frequently see today. One of my favorite dungeons in the game has to be the Valley of Corrupted Gravity. The Valley of Corrupted Gravity is the site of a battle that took place over 10,000 years ago, a battle between the Winglies and humans, wherein a massive concentration of magical energy caused the gravity to distort in unpredictable ways. It's not much for puzzles, but the unique anti-gravity gimmick makes exploring and finding the hidden loot that much more fun. Not to mention the intense mysterious atmosphere Sphere established by both the visuals and the music, as well as the history given to the dungeon itself. This game also contains one of my favorite dungeons ever in Law City Zenobados. The Law City, much like its name implies, is a Law City, rather a place where laws are created. Because this area is so heavily run to the letter of the law by these little droid guys who still occupy it, to get anywhere, Dart and his company must learn the codes of each law that prevents their progress. Once this code is acquired, they bring it to a council to suggest just changes to the bylaw. The council then grants them a ticket, which you have to take to another vendor who can amend the law to your needs. I can see how some people might dislike this, as in a way, it can feel a bit like visiting the DMV. But the absurdity of it all just tickles me, and I think it does wonders to really help the world of endiness feel like a true, living, breathing thing. Something out of pure fantasy that still functions in a way we can relate to, but so foreign in execution, it could only exist here. I suppose to make up for this fantasy, fantastic dungeon though, we also have Death Frontier, a blind desert maze loaded with enemies and pitfall traps to impede your progress at every twist and turn. This dungeon is a 40 screen monstrosity. Death Frontier, like any maze, isn't an issue if you already know where you're going and what to expect. And it could be cleared out in a good 2-3 to three minutes. But on a first run with no guide, this dungeon gets old fast, and you'll learn to hate it before it's over. Thankfully, Death Frontier is something of an exception in this game 
game. Most dungeons I really tend to enjoy. Moving on from that though, if there's one area Legend of Dragoon may be lacking in, it's that of optional content. There's a small handful of events that can be missed, such as the wedding scene in Danau or the painting of Lavitz you can get commissioned in Bale. There's also some mini games and puzzles you can partake in for rewards. And there's a whole whack of NPC dialogue that gets swapped out after main story events pass. In rare cases, there's even different methods for completing certain tasks, such as unlocking the Dragoon Spirit for Kongle, with the most common and more highly recommended option being to just buy it from the merchant in Lohan. On this playthrough, however, I decided to hold off on this and get his Dragoon Spirit where the main story would normally give it to you, something I had never done before, and it was an absolutely stupid idea. I would never recommend anybody do it this way. If you don't buy Kongle's Dragoon Spirit from the merchant in Lohan, you will not acquire it until a couple hours away from the very end of the game, at which point it's basically useless. You can't even feasibly level it up to unlock the more high power spells by that point. It's an absolutely awful place to get it and reeks of cut content. That aside, by and large, the offering for real side quests is heavily lacking, to the point where you can probably count the real ones on one hand. But what they do have is at least mostly good. Fun quests with unique bosses, good XP rewards, and often good character stories or lore attached to them, like the quest to save the spirits of the Dragoons who perished in the war 11,000 years ago. There is one large ongoing side quest that spans the entire runtime of the game up until you hit the point of no return, and this is the quest to collect 50 hidden stardust. In my many playthroughs, this is a quest that I've never completed, though this time I was intent on seeing what you get for it, so I used a guide for this part of the game, and I gotta say, the act of collecting stardust, while not a bad idea, is not executed well by modern standards. Ultimately, I don't mind it, but speaking critically, I think most people would consider it to be poor design. See, it used to be a bit more normal in games to click the interact button on every environment detail just to see if it would generate a response, no matter how mundane an object might be. And this is something you'd be doing without any prompts indicating what can or cannot be interacted with. And because of this, the Stardust quest essentially becomes a game of where's Waldo, only there's 50 Waldos across hundreds of screens and they're all invisible. Now in the game, it's said when you collect all 50 Stardust, the person who does so will be granted a wish. This wish does not get cashed in by our main party, but by somebody they feel needs it more than they do. And in return, the party is given a key item to use in another side quest. A side quest that leads to none other than the hardest boss battle in the game, Magician Faust. I put off fighting this boss until I hit the point of no return and completed literally every side quest in the game, becoming as strong as I could reasonably be without immense amounts of grinding, even buying a couple near game-breaking pieces of legendary armor along the way. And how did my fight go? So yeah, this quest is kind of bullshit. After all that searching for Stardust and completing every scrap of content accessible before the point of no return, I still feel miles and miles away from being able to do this fight. Looking through forums and guides, I concluded that if I want to beat this, I'll need to spend a good eight or more hours grinding for levels and gold. And if I do that, then the final boss becomes a pushover. And I love how strong and enduring that final boss is when you reach him naturally. I'd go so far as to say he's one of the best balanced final final boss fights I've ever come across. So no, I couldn't bring myself to defeat this optional boss. The idea of grinding to the point where I'd ruin the endgame content for this one measly fight whose rewards aren't even that great, especially during a day and age where I can just see the results of the fight on YouTube, doesn't sit the best with me. I'm just not up to wasting my time or breaking my game for this one guy. Like, no thanks. This guy's poops. Th that was a typo in my script. I, I meant to say this guy's poop, but I'm gonna leave it. He He's both poop and poops. However, maybe that grind for money and gear wouldn't be so bad if the Legend of Dragoon was localized in a more complete fashion. But that didn't really happen, though we can't really blame the localization process for that entirely. They'd done the best with what was available. Thing is, 
The Legend of Dragoon originally had a minigame in it tied to the Pocket Station, a portable companion device to the Sony PlayStation that you could play minigames on similar to the Dreamcast's BMU. If you've never heard of this device, that doesn't surprise me as it never made its way outside of Japan. The minigame in question that you could play on it loosely translates to Moguru Dabas or Dabas Underground Adventure, named after the character you get the minigame from, Dabas, a merchant you save in Volcano Valud. The primary purpose of the this little one-bit spelunking minigame was to give players a method of farming gold well away from home. It's not a terribly in-depth game or anything, but it was quite sophisticated for the hardware that had to run on. With this not being an option outside of Japan, gold drops from enemies were increased, but perhaps not enough for some of that high-level gear to be acceptably accessible. At least, not for that one fight, or not for me personally. Of course, cutting this minigame outside of Japan meant cutting a lot of lines that would have surrounded it in-game. However, there is some text remaining that still gives the impression there's some minigame here that for whatever reason you just can't access, leaving Dart, like the player, standing there scratching his head. And it's not like this was the only piece of altered content either, though it was by far the most significant. Rose's Demon Gate animation had all the blood recolored from red to black, and like, I get it, if you really look at the animation, the original Japanese one has some strange implications. In addition to enemy HP being lowered and XP and gold gains going up, the strength of attack items items was also increased. And though not intentional, some mistranslations also give the illusion of altered content, such as Hashel's Flurry of Sticks attack, which in the North American version is translated as such in all instances including voiceovers, except for the words that appear on the screen when it's being performed. Take that! This text reading instead as Fairy of Sticks, a more sensible and accurate romanization of the original title Sanzuno Wata, or Fairy of the River Sanzu. Mistakes like this were somewhat common in the era, however, and Legend of Dragoon certainly wasn't an exception. At the time of its release, The Legend of Dragoon was one of the most eye-popping games on home console. After so many years in development and so close to the release of the PlayStation 2, one would certainly hope this to be the case. And thankfully, this wasn't just a game that looked good for its time. A great deal of it has aged beautifully thanks to the pre-rendered 3D environments and some hand-painted backgrounds. Most assets that are strictly polygonal in nature, however, do show their age. Battle arenas, for instance, are lackluster at best, and character models, while they can look good in battle and cutscenes, look a bit worse for wear in the overworld, often revealing some cracks in the foundation of the game's performance. With some polygons disappearing on certain certain angles, creating odd holes in the models, or parts of the body twitching and acting generally unstable. On an old CRT, this might not have been that noticeable, but on today's HD and UHD televisions, it's pretty hard to miss. Sound effects aren't exactly anything special, but there is a great use of voiceovers during additions that help you nail your combos with less reliance on the visual aid. But let's make no mistake, the voiceovers in the game are all over the place. While some of them are good, most are not. But I'd be wrong to neglect there's a certain charm to it all. And we have to bear in mind too that this was a PS1 game and voiceovers were still a novel concept, so I'm not gonna complain too much. But a spade is a spade. It sounded like a lot of the voice lines were likely recorded in a single session, and at times the voice actor's vocal cords had already been run raw. And that may have just been the case. David Babich, the voice actor for Albert and Melbu Frama, had the following to say of the time he spent in the booth. I regret not appreciating those sessions as much as I should have, because recording this might have only been one or two sessions for me. As the actor, it's like I'm just going to do a day or two of work for this game, but for others, it becomes something so grand. So I'm much more aware now that I was part of such a bigger story than just little me. For most voice actors on the game, their job was limited to one or two sessions in the recording booth. And while they'd done what they could with the talent they had and the time that they had, many of the performers had no idea the legacy the game would leave behind, nor was anybody putting pressure on their performances to be better. When it came to getting The Legend of Dragoon released in North America, the voice acting simply wasn't that high of a priority for the localization team, and North America wasn't alone in that regard, with some of the dubs becoming something of an ironic sensation for the quality of the performance. One thing, however, that people largely agreed on the world over was the quality of the soundtrack. 
Many people neglect to bring it up today as it's not loaded with blazing heavy metal guitars, synth, or string leads wailing from one end of the game to the next, but what it does have is a tour de force of cultural sounds and inspirations that reinforce the strength of culture you experience as you venture across the world of endiness. This OST was written by two men, Dennis Martin, a New York-based composer and recording engineer, and Japan's own Takeo Miratsu. Dennis Martin was hired on initially as the sole composer, being chose as an outside talent simply due to his different culture, meaning he would likely turn in music less familiar to the world of Japanese games. However, as the project grew and he was still something of a greenhorn, it became clear he'd be needing some backup, so eventually, Takeo Maratsu was also brought into the fold. Though the two never collaborated on tracks or even met during development of the game, they both turned in career-defining tracks under the guidance of their higher-ups in Japan's studio. Dennis Martin's tracks in particular stand out here. Though he initially approached writing for the game to be almost entirely focused on cultural percussion sounds, Japan Studio would write him back looking for revisions, insisting the soundtrack be more focused on strong thematic melodies. What Dennis turned in with this constructive criticism would be a marriage of the two ideas that still stands the test of time, despite the limited sound chip the music would be performed on. That is, all tracks would be performed on this sound chip except for the title's theme, if you still believe. A theme that featured a full band recording and the immense vocal talents of Elsa Raven, also known as Elsa Cornish. Muratsu, on the other hand, is not to be denied his credit, having written some of the catchiest and most memorable battle themes of the generation, as well as some of the more upbeat and fun songs that can be found throughout the game. Though the differences between the composers is somewhat night and day, it would be a fool who says the songs or tones clash. Both composers turned in stellar work that reinforced the respective areas the game they were writing for and deserved significantly more credit than they ever got for the job. And as anybody who's played the game will tell you, we cannot talk about the music without at least mentioning the greatest menu music ever written. There is just something so undeniably good about this sound. Now, at this point, we've taken a pretty comprehensive look at the game, and I've done my best to address my biases and wear my critic's cap where needed to not give a misleading impression of it. So I'd like to go back to something I mentioned at the start of the video now. I always have, and likely always will, refer to The Legend of Dragoon as a favorite game of mine, despite any of its issues and despite the very real fact that I have played several RPGs I might consider better. A lot of the times throughout the years when I tell people it's my favorite RPG, I met with responses that would imply surprise or even disappointment. Responses like, really, that game is your favorite? Like it's something they just can't possibly comprehend, as if it's a matter of bad taste. And that's fair, I guess. To many people, favorite as a word is a stand-in for this is the best game made or the best game I've ever played. But that's not really how the word works to me. Something being a favorite of mine can be due to the sheer brilliance of its execution, to the quality of its build. But it can also be due to the importance it held in my life at the time I played it and the emotional attachment I have to it. And that goes beyond simple things like nostalgia. It's something that can't be quantified in simple words or equations or examinations of a game's writing, balance, or visuals. So now would be a good time to tell you that the intro of this video wasn't just a quirky, fun spin on the 2000s to introduce the game with, but rather a bit of a metaphor. When I played The Legend of Dragoon for the first time, I obviously was not hiding from some horrific Y2K fallout. To illustrate this, I'd like to take you all on a bit of a journey to the house I grew up in. So this is the house that I grew up in. Nobody's lived here for about 12 years. It's obviously rather condemned now, but that's not really why it looks like this. To be honest, it didn't exactly look a whole lot worse when I lived here 15, 16, 17 years ago. Uh, that was my room up there. 
So obviously this house is um, set to get torn down soon. You can see they kind of have equipment over here for that. And I think that's been a plan since it was sold about 12 years ago. Just completely bulldoze this thing and build something new. So this is the last chance I'm gonna have to go inside and kind of take this last little walk through my history. So while we're here, uh, there's somewhere I'd like to visit. So I do not trust um, the stability of this house at all. But we're going in. This stairwell is so much more narrow than I remember. Uh, let's go up. So this was my bedroom uh, when I was like 11 or 12 when I first played Legend of Dragoon. It's uh, very clearly not quite how I left it. So this closet here, uh, I actually pushed that desk into there probably when I was about 10. And this is gonna sound really edgy, but I used to sit in there and write uh, on loose leaf, just write stories and uh, draw and listen to Evanescence's Fallen on repeat. I know it's edgy, but it was a good album. If we look, there's probably still some stuff in here. You want to pass me the camera? Probably still some old pictures. Oh yeah. Uh, I didn't draw very many of those. those. Some of those are printed. Oh, Riddle of the Sphinx. I had that on PC. That was a fun game. Jesus. So much of my junk is still in here. There should be more drawings, but... This was my old CD player. I wonder if Fallen is still in here. I think I had it burnt. Oh, it's empty. It is really gross to touch this stuff. Anyway, this is all not very important to what I want to talk about. So, what I want to talk about and why I wanted to come here is what it means for something to be somebody's favorite game. A lot of people confuse this term as, you know, favorite is the best game you ever played or something like that. For me, Legend of Dragoon is my second favorite game of all time. Not because I think it's the second best game I ever played, but because it's arguably the most important game uh, in my life. So the first time I ever played it was in this room right here. I had a, a little TV here, a five inch screen, black and white, doubled as an AM FM radio. It doesn't still appear to be here, uh, unlike so many other things. And um, playing Legend of Dragoon here for the first time, I've, I've talked about my past uh, in other videos in the Ring Fit video. My life here wasn't good. I had a lot of anxiety issues since I was eight years old, and a lot of that had to do with my, my family life and my living conditions here. Playing Legend of Dragoon for the first time was the first time I ever experienced escapism in a proper way. And a lot of people throw that word around, escapism, like, you know, just playing video games is escapism. But this was the first time that I got involved in something in this house, and I could forget about worrying that I'd hear my voice, or my name, sorry, be called from downstairs. So, for me, playing Legend of Dragoon was like, I wasn't actually here. I was in that other world with these other characters. And I didn't have to worry about all these external pressures going on beyond me. And because of that, it is, it is one of the most important games I ever played, and I hold it very dear to me. So when I say it's one of my favorite games of all time, that's why. So to say it had a big effect on my life might be a bit of an understatement. Thankfully, you know, I, I got out of this house in my living conditions just a couple years after that. I probably moved out of here when I was 14 or 15 years old. Sounds young to some people. I understand, but if you really knew what my life was like here, um, it, that was getting out of here later than I should have. This is probably the last time I'll ever step foot in this house. So this house is probably not going to exist beyond. Probably not going to make it to the rest of the year, actually. Let me take this camera for a second. This was also my bedroom at one point in time, and the ceiling was collapsing even when I lived in here. And it looks like it's really come down now. Oh yeah, oh that is just nasty. There's a old single pane window back there. Just to give you guys some experience of what some of my life was like here. That, uh, one of those middle panes there 
was broken for about two, three years straight. We used to stuff it with a, a pillow to keep snow out during the winter. And I'll tell you, even with that, it was really fucking cold in here. But this is all about to be ancient history. To not say too much, I didn't have a good life at home, and I developed depression and anxiety at a very young age. Escapes were rare for me. After all, at such a young age, not even fully able to realize the damage your environment is doing to you, how many escapes can you even make for yourself? The Legend of Dragoon was my first real escape. The world captivated me in a way that gave me a peace I didn't have in my everyday life. Though fictional, it showed me a world, characters, and emotions I longed to believe in, and it helped me in some small way realize another life could exist for me outside of my troubled upbringing. That, as the game would put it, I was free to break the chains of fate that bound me. My life as it was would not be permanent. My freedom and my own adventures would one day be within my grasp. And as soon as it was within my reach, just in my early to mid-teens, I would take it. The Legend of Dragoon set me on a path. Directly or indirectly, in minor and major ways, I still owe a lot of who I am because of the time I spent with it in the early 2000s. And every time I revisit it, it feels like visiting home. But the home I longed to have, and the home I fell in love with when my own was nothing to be proud of. Now the clips I showed you here of my home, I recorded months prior to actually starting my replay of this game and starting this script. I just knew that I was eventually going to be doing this, so I would like to have that video ready. When I visited home, it was condemned. The property had been bought and sold more than once, and the house was set to be torn down. This is probably the last time I'll ever step foot in this house, because this house is probably not going to exist beyond. Probably not going to make it to the rest of the year, actually. Only a week after I recorded this, I received a text from my mom down home showing that the house was officially gone. And I'm torn on this. That house was a bad place, and I had almost nothing but bad memories attached to it. But it being there meant that I could still go there and confront my past. It was in some way a reminder of where I came from, and though confronting my past there never really seems to get me any further ahead in life, it's still something that I felt was important to do from time to time. Though I've more or less moved on from my history, it's part of me that I feel like I'll never get over. Only a couple weeks before this video went up, I received a text from my sister showing that a new house was being built over the property, and I sincerely hope that whoever's living there now has a much happier life than I did at the time. I guess now, with my old house gone, the Legend of Dragoon still serves a role in my life as a way of confronting my past, but rather than being a place to go to to think on all the terrible things that happened growing up, it's a way for me to remember a time when I was happy at a young age, a time that was pretty rare all things considered, and that will always be special for me, and that's something that I will never get in any other game, and because of this, The Legend of Dragoon will always be among my favorites. So here we are over 20 years later. The legacy this game holds for me should be quite clear, and the legacy it holds online is enduring, even if not everybody shares the same enthusiasm. But what has become of the IP itself and those who worked on it? The game's director, Yasuyuki Hasabi, would work on games less and less following the release of The Legend of Dragoon, eventually going completely radio silent until 2018, when he was named as the director of Soliton Solution, a video on demand and security network service company. The young up-and-comer Shuhei Yoshida's career would catapult from here, eventually leading him all the way to the president seat for Sony Interactive Entertainment's Worldwide Studios, a position he would hold for 11 long years. Dennis Martin, LOD's main composer, would continue composing and studio recording as his main career path for the next while. He would later launch Trend and Chaos, an online music form, blog, and record label. Elsa Raven, the singer for the main theme, If You Still Believe, continued her career as a vocalist periodically, with her music being focused around a blend of jazz and EDM elements. Takeo Miratsu, the game's secondary composer, would eventually meet Dennis at a rap party for the game, with the two hitting it off rather well, both hoping to collaborate on a project again in the future. Over the next couple years, Takeo would get scattered work composing for video games and anime, most notable of which being his contribution to the Beat Mania games. However, he and Dennis would sadly never worked together again. In September of 2006, as a result of liver cancer, Miratsu-san passed away, 46 years young. Gone, but never forgotten. The voice actors largely went in separate directions after working on the game, 
with many never having another credit to their name. However, a good handful of them did continue getting voice roles, on-screen acting roles, or even backstage roles such as production supervisor or sound department credits, mostly in film and television. As for the title itself, it's hard to tell where it stands now. Japan Studio has been shut down and Sony doesn't seem too interested in reviving the IP. Though it was successful, it was also very expensive to make, and creating something else that lives up to its legacy in this day and age is a bit of a big commitment. There was rumor once that PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale, Sony's answer to Nintendo's Super Smash Bros., would have Dart as a DLC character, though this never actually came to pass. Rumors persist on a yearly basis as well that Bluepoint Studios may be handling a remake or remaster of the game, and every now and then Bluepoint leans into this for fun on social media, though nothing has been confirmed. In a 2012 blog post from PlayStation.com, Shuhei Yoshida revealed a sequel was once put into pre-production, stating the following. I still occasionally hear from fans of The Legend of Dragoon, and many want to know if there is a sequel. Legend of Dragoon 2 was put into pre-production after I left the Japan studio, but was eventually cancelled for some unknown reason, and the team members moved on to different projects. Some people still work in the Japan studio, so we talk about the memories of developing Legend of Dragoon when we see each other at company functions. I personally recall some years back reading an interview about The Legend of Dragoon 2's pre-production, though I am unable to find that interview again now, so I ask that all of you take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt until the evidence of this interview can pop up again. But what I recall of this interview left me with some peace of mind over us never getting a sequel. The long and short of it was that the team was shocked that a sequel was even being asked for, as the game was expensive to make and didn't turn as much profit as Sony would have liked to see. Further, it was only ever intended to be a one-off game. Despite this, in response to fan request, they put the game into pre-production and started brainstorming ideas, only to realize early on that nothing they were coming up with exactly fit the IP the way it needed to, or felt good enough to adapt into a full-fledged 40-hour RPG. Quite frankly, they just didn't have anything they wanted to work with, and instead of phoning it in, it was quietly dropped and moved on from. Perhaps someday plans will be picked up again and with more inspiration, but for now, it's probably for the best that we never got that sequel. On the topic of remakes, I found myself going back and forth over the years. Typically, I felt that a remake was never necessary and a remaster wouldn't need a whole lot of work. Just up the resolution, clean up the backgrounds and models a bit, and maybe make some of the menu navigation like shops a little less cumbersome to use. For the most part, I've always felt the game was fine as it is and hasn't aged all that much. And going back to it now, I still love playing it just as much as I did when it was new, though I can see much more merit in the idea of a remake today. The world in Legend of Dragoon is incredible, but sometimes it feels like it could use more room to breathe and grow. Same with the characters. I'd love to see a remake that expands on character interactions as much as, say, Final Fantasy VII R did, though I would prefer if they could do this without expanding every section to the lengths that they would need to release it in multiple installments. The overworld in particular, I feel, could stand to be completely overhauled. I am a sucker for old overworlds, but this whole rigid line from point A to point B kind of thing is pretty low on my list of design preferences. And while that's being expanded, it would be a great opportunity to add more side quests, better fast travel systems, new game plus modes or post-game content, all of which Legend of Dragoon is pretty lacking on. In light of all these things, my desire for a remake has certainly grown, though the game as it is has maintained its position for me as my favorite RPG ever made. Nothing will ever touch the impact it had on my life or the feelings I get turning it on again. The fact that everything else feels like it's just made for me and connects with my gameplay tendencies so strongly is just a bonus on top of all that. Besides, it's not like a remake will ever erase the original or my memories with it. Those will always be there and nothing will take them away. And whether or not Sony ever greenlights a sequel, I will always cherish my opportunity to return to this game when life gets me down and my anxieties are closing in on me. A chance to reset to a certain point in my life where I could clear my head and exist in a totally different way. Hide from the troubles of the world and breathe again. And though it seems in this day and age in a lot of circles online and from any important company involved in this game's creation that it's been forgotten or left behind, there is always a faint whisper to be heard from another fan echoing from the other side of the void. And if you stop and you listen, 
you can hear it. A small chance of hope that the spirits of the Dragoon, called by fate, will awaken again for a new generation to pick up the torch and save the world with. A small chance that we'll be blessed by something that can faithfully carry on the game's legacy. Something the bulk of us old fans will likely delight in experiencing. Reconnecting with our childhoods, and by that point, likely sharing in the experience with children of our own. A chance that is, if you still believe. I had a dream that I could fly. I can feel each moment as time goes by. We'd never be too far away. You would always be here, I heard you say. I never And with that, my long overdue and long-winded coverage of The Legend of Dragoon has come to a close. Thank you, everybody who stuck around and watched the whole thing front to back, even if you just watched a few minutes and left a like. Thank you, I really appreciate it. So the only thing left now is uh, one more reminder to check out the links I left in the description to the other channels, and uh, a sneak peek at a couple games I plan on covering in the near future. Check it out. careful with that one. Let me see. Hold his arm a moment. Hey, hey, hey. Malolo III, Master of Shadows, at your service. Catch me if you can.